Welcome to Forever Unbreakable, everybody. Uh, tonight I am joined by Jeremiah School, the man, the myth, the legend. The guy has given away more clothes off the, more shirts off of his back than any human being I know. Hence, right there, Innova Technology got this one at the 1291 Thorndale House. Compliments of Jeremiah about 2.30 in the morning, I think. So I appreciate all of the wonderful gear that I have I have acquired. given gear away sober, <laughs> just so you know. You have. You have. have. Yes. The, uh, the last shirt, actually, you and your wife uh, asked me what size I wanted and then placed an order and then got it to me. <laughs> what? I'm sick of giving you the, the ones out of the laundry basket. I like them. I like them. They're worn. They're comfortable. They're broken in. Um, so yeah, so this is, uh, this is Jeremiah. He is a, um, and the main reason why I wanted to bring him on to, uh, forever unbreakable tonight is to, uh, talk about business, business ownership and, and, uh, many of the things that a, that a business owner goes through that I think are oftentimes overlooked or, or super underappreciated, um, as I'm learning, going through the process of, of forever unbreakable. Um, and kind of, as I learned with, with who has a charity running it mildly like a business. So it's, it's unique. And the, the first thing that I want to talk about is, is day one. So you have this idea that you want to start, start this company, but you know that you've got to get, you know, funds to do so and, and everything that it takes to start a company. So what, what was going on in your mind and how did you get that process started? And then what was it like the first time that you approached an investor and were like, Hey guy, I have an idea and it, hopefully it's going to be worth something someday. Yeah. Well, you know, it presented itself with an opportunity to uh, do something other than what I was doing, or maybe to do that uh, with different management above me. Um, I'm lucky enough to have a dad that's an entrepreneur. And if there's one thing he taught me, it's just to not fear giving something like that a shot. So I saw that as the opportunity and the path forward. Um, didn't really, you know, think about risks and everything else. I just knew that there were certain things that I needed to accomplish. One of those being funding, another being a business plan. I spent, I spent probably a year putting a business plan together and, you know, was all proud, went to, um, a guy that I was pretty confident would, um, have the capability or the ability to be able to invest in me, um, showed him this big fancy business plan that I was so proud of and he didn't even look at it. <laughs> really? Um, yeah, yeah. That, <laughs> that thing was trash Dustin. I mean, it was, it was a, it was a gut check, you know, at that moment, um, and had basically, you know, learned negotiation 101, uh, of which was basically, uh, well, I believe in you, and if you want to do this, how much do you want? And um, I gave him a price, and he sawed it in half, and I said, okay, let's start, you know, and that's, uh, that's how it went. So um, like, like, so we, did he saw in half the dollar amount and the equity, or, or how did he saw that in half exactly? No, it was, it was originally split up between three different people, so... Um, I think his primary concern was just, um, majority shareholder and I'm learning through being in business, you know, long enough that, um, you know, 60% is, is really no more different, different than 51%, but, uh, 51% is a heck of a lot different than 50 or 49, especially. So it's just the majority ownership i mean ultimately you're the one who holds the cards in the ultimate say on stuff if you're if you're going through troubled times with with different partners and so forth your your voice is ultimately as loud as a percentage of shares that you hold um now that's if you're the type of people that are going to operate around agreements contractual things only um my business partners were always handshake kind of guys and um yeah we're obviously to the point now to where well you know this that um yeah. you know i have i'm now in a position to have the company 100 percent, which 
really doesn't change much for me at all. It just means that the responsibility is all on my shoulders instead of anyone else's, but I don't really feel it's been any different in the last and we're, and years. We're, and we're definitely going to talk about that responsibility, yeah, but, but uh, I want to I go back to something because I didn't know... I've never heard the how the actual like negotiation part went down. So was he at one time the majority stakeholder in the company? Yeah. So see, I didn't know that. That's that's super cool to me, knowing that now you know you're in the process of of getting that 100 percent if if you haven't already. Yeah. So the we I started with another working partner, and the third partner, the the money man, if you will, was just simply that. He was our angel investor. Um, he was he was what venture capital is to the Facebooks and Ubers of the world, right? Um, just in a, in the very small business. Um, so he provided us the accounting um, insight, if you will, with his, from his resources. So we've been able to leverage his, um, let's just say, controller. Um, CFO, if you will, from the beginning and um, her and her team's knowledge, even to this day um, in training Chelsea and so forth. Um, but um, and I know that his resources have been huge for you because he does a lot of like property development and things like that. So he's been able to land you, you know, buildings to to occupy for your yeah, business absolutely. and stuff like that. There is you know, contracts at a, at a much greater discounted rate i would think well and um more so the the capability to be able to trade services back and forth and i think one thing that's really important about that and a lessons learned from my perspective was it you can never clearly define expectations enough it you and then communicate those expectations one thing that i always wanted to make sure that wasn't a point of contention is the fact that i'm I have square footage that he could be renting out to someone else in exchange for computer services, if you will, or for IT services in return. And how does, you know, guys like him, guys that are the visionaries in organizations, they're not in the weeds of why it's costing X amount of dollars a month to manage something or it's costing X of thousands of dollars to do this IT project. There's the in a, the capability to see the value without insight from someone like myself is very difficult for them. So it was important for me to really lay it all out. Like, hey, you're giving me this space, and I know that that's costing you a couple dollars a month. I mean, let's be honest, a lot more than that to to have the bathrooms cleaned. Like, we should share in that. You're paying yeah. for the electricity. We really laid all of those things out and then showed what we were actually providing so that we could actually year to year say, what are we giving each other? And there were times when he was heavily winning on that and his perception was that he wasn't. Um, and us providing those numbers, I didn't come back and say, hey, I want you to shore up the difference. But at the very least, I was able to provide the awareness so that we were all on the same page. We Our expectations were mutual at that point. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think that's huge. And that's something that I I feel like I would have bypassed. And, and a lot of people would have bypassed. And you would have just taken it as a grain of salt and been like, okay, yep, this is you know, this is what I lost last year to helping him. Oh, don't get me but wrong. Not, but not comparing the two. And I think that's super important to, to do that so then you know – how much you're actually giving and are you on the better end of the deal or the short end of the deal, you know, and how do you make it, especially for him as a guy who wants to see you be successful. If you're shelling out more than your fair share of money, uh, that's an issue I would think from an investor standpoint too, in, in watching you grow, because ultimately if, you know, for numbers sake, if he gave you 10 grand, he wants to see that 10 grand turn to 10 million, right? So he needs to, you know, provide you, in some cases, the assistance to, to do that. And so I think that what you just said is super important to, to how you guys grew as a company, I would guess. And I was just going to say, don't get me wrong, we definitely didn't start that year one. Um, but it was apparent that expectations needed to be aligned after year one to make sure that that was a part of the annual review with him year two. Yeah. Um, and I And again, you know, making sure that those annual reviews of just talking about everything um 
within the appetite of what he wanted to hear. You know, he's one of those give it to me in three bullet points or less kind of guys. Um, there's other people that you work with and they want things in three pages. Yeah. Um, and you really have to know your audience. And in that case, and in, and I think that's typical with guys like, um, with guys like my, uh, my previous, um, share holder investor partner. Um, yeah. but those, those guys are usually really keep it simple, quick, give it to I me. I mean, he's, how many businesses does he have like actively running? Would you guess? Oh, Cause I'm guessing you don't have a real number. I don't. And but it's I mean, huge because he invests in people all the time that are just trying to get off the ground. Yeah, absolutely. I and it and it's got to be really fun to get to that point. I mean, there's there's a lot of reading that I do to, that really talks about. I mean, Robert Kiyosaki is always about getting into that um, that investor quadrant, so to speak. Yeah. Um, and to have to have the dispensable income to be able to take risks um, with young talent or just talent in yeah, general. Yeah, I mean, you guys this were a huge risk. Fun. You were a oh, huge absolutely. risk. absolutely. Absolutely. To him, that money was gone. I mean, that that money was gone for the first five years to him, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and you've been in business for how long with him? Uh, I just bought him out like two months ago. So a little under 10 years. Yeah. So for 10 years, you know, most of that time he's not expecting any return. And then... Finally, and we'll get to the point where the business started to turn and you started to make money for the first time. You know, up until that day, the money that he gave you is is gone. Like it's a like it's essentially a loss to him. Oh yeah, and the it's reality crazy. is, is that money was gone within the first, you know, before the first year was over. Um, which we've talked about many times the associated struggles with being able to make your own payroll. Um, pay all of your bills, live, you know, all of those things um, yeah. when you're trying to start out and you only have so much money to do that. And we're not talking about like the, the, you have the, you know, a uh, million dollars being injected into your company that you can use to grow and stuff. I mean, there was, there was basically enough capital there to be able to provide half of a salary for two of us. And that was it. Um, you know, a couple computers and away we went. So we had to, we had to hit the round the ground like really hard running day one. Yeah. So let's talk, let's let's uh, rewind here a second to what we probably should have told people is what is a Nova technology? Yeah, so like yeah, what wow, is it? We're finally at that point. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's a little late so, in the game. So essentially, you know, like the elevator speech sort of thing is we are an IT department for companies that don't have an IT department or we assist IT departments of one to five people in skill set gaps that they may have or to help them leverage tool sets that we use to manage systems where we are the full IT department. Um, so we'll really partner with them um, or partner with the whole organization and be their entire IT department. Um, typically work with companies on a smaller range from 10 to 50 computers and we'll work with larger organizations where you're 50 up to 300 plus computers. Yeah, that's crazy. So yeah. talk about like, so we talked about, you know, how the, basically the seed money or, or startup money wasn't much at all. And you gave away the majority of the company, but computers aren't cheap. And this is 10 years ago where computers are even more expensive than they are today. The storage is more expensive than the, than it is today. Yeah. So like how nervous were you when you first opened the doors to Innova technology and you still had to buy, you know, product and software and, and things like that? Like how nervous was it starting, starting day one, knowing that, you know, this investor just entrusted in you with, a, you know, X amount of money to go out and, and try to become successful. Like, yeah, how nervous he, were you? It, well, I mean, it was, the nerves were all around paying bills. You know, I don't, I don't think there is too many other greater stresses than financial stress. And I've always been way too humble to go back to my dad and ask him to cut me checks because, you know, I can't make my bills sort of thing. So um, there have been times where I would go many weeks without taking a paycheck. Um, 
Yeah, Obviously, I remember Chelsea's gone over a year without taking a paycheck when she first joined the company. Um, so yeah, you make those you make those sacrifices. Um, you had I am just remembering just before you had mentioned something about the ownership. So the way that we split it up is that my business partner and I, um, the working partner, had each got thirty percent, and the the money man, if you will, had forty. And um, there was there were there was mismanagement, lack of communication, lack of setting expectation over the course of those first five years, the struggle of, of all of it, and um, not doing the right things put the whole company, essentially the three shareholders, in a situation to where the company either needed to just close the books right there or dig in deep and really and really get the thing to be something that was valuable um, and not from a monetary perspective, but just from a, a, a team member perspective. So, and did you um, have any employees at this point? Yeah. At that point we had, um, probably five employees or something. Okay. So, um, so then at that point I, I made the decision to say, Hey, look, um, I will write the ship, but if I'm going to write the ship, then I would like to be the majority shareholder. So it en ended up working out to where I ultimately became 60% owner and the money man still had his 40%. So you had to buy out your other partner yep. full out outright at that point. Yep, exactly. Yep. <clears throat> now, I mean, the, the, the buyout was, you know, the buyout was what it was just because of the circumstances at that time. And, um, and you know, I mean, when you're running a when you're running a business at zero profit or a loss, you know, every single year, uh, there's the the value, if you will, of those shares is is not much. I mean, no, and I can only imagine how little it becomes because it's it's much like you know anything if it's not if it's not working, the value is worth worth little to nothing. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. and it, I think way too many times. People that start their own businesses feel that their companies are worth a lot more than they actually are, just because there's that there's that blood, sweat, and tears side. Yeah, I'm sure know. your business plan had it written out. I mean, you said he cut it in half, so like, you know, I'm sure your business plan had it written out that your company was worth. Obviously, it was worth double to you. Oh no, I'm not saying at the business plan side. I'm saying even even now at ten years on. Yeah. That there's a lot of there's a lot of people that that assume that their business is worth a lot more than it actually is. You know, the important thing to understand is that <laughs> something is only worth what someone else is willing to pay for it. You, know, yeah, you can that's slap absolutely... as big of a sticker on that thing as you want. <laughs> you know, it doesn't really matter sometimes, but, um, but yeah, so, uh, I know there was a couple other things that you, yeah, well, we're going to keep getting, we're going to keep getting to it. Yeah. yeah. We're going to, I mean, the, the, the thing is that, all of this kind of segues into, you know, um, from day one to today. You yeah, know? exactly. So trying to do it from a from a timeline perspective gets to be a little tough. Yeah, because I mean, you've you've had a roller coaster. Um, oh, absolutely. Of, of a of a company, and and one thing that I want to touch on is this survivability. When you were at that point of like getting to write this ship, like I remember coming here, coming over here um, to your and Chelsea's house to hang out and grab dinner and stuff, you know, in, in a drink. And you guys wouldn't be able to oftentimes because you were busy working on trying to, you know, make a Nova what it was and still survive. So there was times where we would come over and Chelsea would be sitting on the floor peeling these stickers off of pages for hours and hours and hours just to yep. make an extra, like, it was probably like 10 bucks an hour she was making to 10 do that. 10 bucks an hour, that's exactly what it was, yeah. Yeah. And, and, uh, like talk about what it was like and, and how, you know, proud you were then and how proud you are now to look back at those, those times and to like, see her believe in your passion as well and know that you guys were going to be successful and it was just going to be this grind to get there. Like, what was it like for you then? Um, and, and just kind of like how you felt about your wife at the time and, and the things well, that you guys were sacrificing to make it possible. Uh, you know, the best way that I can relate it to is you know, go through, go through a, go through a devastating event. Now let's be honest. Um, what's devastating to one person is completely subjective, right? So, 
Um, but go go through a very traumatic experience with a loved one or with a with a relationship that you have. That's exactly what it's like to go through that type of stuff within the business. You know, you're you're up all night wondering, gosh, should should I just should I just let it go? Should I just you know go go find a different path? Should I should I stick this out? Should I invest the time that's going to need to be invested into it to make it um, be what I ultimately want it to be? Um, and at the moment of saying, okay, I'm going to write this ship, um, I wasn't really sure if I was going to be able to do it on my own or not. So I talked with Chelsea, excuse me, and uh, Chelsea was able to go to her place of employment and say, hey, my husband really needs my help. And um, I don't know if I am going to quit or if I'm going to come back, but I have a couple weeks of vacation and if I could use all of my vacation to just try to get things figured out with him and then come back and see where things are at, let me know. Um, and we ended up going through that period, absolutely understood that she would, and I mean, you know, I can't thank that business owner enough um, for doing that. And whenever I see him, I make sure that I that I still say thank you to this day. Because ultimately what he ended up doing is we found that we absolutely needed her time. He ended up giving her another month of pay and kept her health benefits in place so that her and I could keep our benefits all through that time period that she continued to work at Innova only for the opportunity to still have Chelsea um, if she decided to go back. <clears throat> and, that is a, and that's how you take care of employees right there. And I'm sure you learned some lessons that we'll get oh, into man, you bet. because of that. Because, I mean, that is absolutely taking care of people. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and you know, where where I felt really bad is that I and I had always known how great of an employee that Chelsea is just from a dedication perspective, but it's um it's at that point I was like, why would I want her as such a valued resource? I mean, outside of all the things that she is to me personally, but as a as a coworker, as a team member, like why the, why the heck would I want her on someone else's team? Yeah, like I, no, I want her on my team. Yeah, you it's know? like giving your it's like giving it would be like us giving Aaron Rodgers up, right? Like you're an integral honestly, piece of the puzzle. Honestly, like. it really would because Chelsea <laughs> Chelsea is definitely quarterback level when it comes to her position at Anova. That's for sure. No, so. and that's like. I, that's powerful. And it's, you know, like it's super powerful that another person was able to, you know, he or she saw the value as a business owner of her being an employee there and was willing to extend that out. And that's how you take care of employees because Chelsea would have for sure gone back there had, you know, the Innova stuff not continued to work and it not be the right the right thing for you guys oh she probably would have quit and we would have just figured it out you know the tough <laughs> you know but it's but it's yeah. i think that i think that there's a lot of there's a lot of that that happens you know if i'm sure you know a lot of the guys that we know if they're gonna if they're gonna run into a hurdle they're not like oh well it's either if the hurdle is the ones that I can get over or the ones that I can't get over. No, the reality is there's just a list of hurdles and it's just a matter of how high it is and how hard you have to try to get over it. Yeah. And, and continuing to work until yeah. you're, until you're past it. Yeah, exactly. But what's really awesome is that we're lucky to have great people in our lives to where when we're going up against those really big hurdles, that's where they come in to be able to help and knock those things down a little bit. You know, and him being able to come in and provide that to us was him helping us knock that big hurdle down a little bit and, you know, helping us helping us feel some humility in the situation. You know, it's it's very easy in those times to get depressed and get Dude, um, absolutely I can't imagine and, being in, in that position. The amount of depression I would feel and the you know, anxiety I would have and knowing that every day is the potential for some super hard decisions company wise as you look at like the company's survival. So there's kind of like two things that I want to talk about based off of that. One is, you know, that survival of the company and some of the hard decisions, you know, that that come about in your decision to, you know, keep or let go of employees when times are saying like, I need to let go of, you know, one or two employees right now. And then I also want to talk about how you took the company and developed your employees and developed the business to where it 
it eventually became profitable, you know, after that. So yeah. you can take on either one of those two. Yeah, well, we'll start, we'll start with team members. I don't call them employees or team members. Um, and I like that, you know, we've over the years, I've taken a hundred percent of the profitability out of the company and invested it back into the team some way, somehow. Um, the latest investment being the new office space. <clears throat> and I think that stuff is just vital because um, you, I, I never appreciate seeing a business owner that is, that is taking advantage of the luxuries that sometimes being a business owner provides you and not sharing any of that with their team. I just, I just find that rude um, and disrespectful. Um, so that's why all of our offices are 10 by 10. Um, no one, no one needs a bigger office than the next person, so to speak. Um, we're all equals from that perspective. Um, I'm not the highest paid guy in the organization. Um, there, there's all of those things that, that just make me want my team members to understand that I'm one of them. This isn't some hierarchy ranking type of thing, you know, I mean, obviously you need to have structured in a business and all that kind of stuff. I'm definitely not saying that, but you know what I mean? But it's, it's a family environment almost like every time I've been in there, everybody's smiling and I'm like, I don't know how you guys smile doing computer work. Cause yeah. I'm like a hands on more of a, you know, I need to be out in the field doing stuff. And like, it's just a very, happy welcoming uh atmosphere or climate and that's based on the employees and and the culture that you know you've created or you know the team has created ar around each other and i think i think it's super cool every time i walk in there's just this like it's a great feeling and a welcoming feeling there have been times where we definitely <clears throat> could have let someone go in order to make things easier to cut expenses and so forth but um, we've only let, I think one person ever go. And that was just because, um, the long-term potential just wasn't there, you know? And, but otherwise, um, we, we really look for long-term potential and we were the type of company we do not beat around the bush. Um, like I had said before, we're handshake kind of guys, so to speak. Um, so, um, one thing that, you know, we've talked about in the past is just making sure that when you bring people into the company that you're setting them on a path for success and then, you know, allowing them to have a voice in that to say, hey, here's here's a roadmap that we've laid out for you over the course of the next 90 days and 12 months. Is that something that you agree with? Do you think that we should change anything? And in a lot of cases, you're just providing them the platform and recommendations to have that conversation around again, coming back to the communicate and set expectations thing. I mean, we beat that up so much at work and, um, you, you really have to, um, in, in that's, if you can beat that up at home and with your friends and family as well, it's definitely not going to do you any harm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's something that <clears throat> the communication piece is something that I've definitely learned even, even more from you and watching the way that, that you handle that piece. And I think that that's a big, uh, integral part to how that you how you've developed a lot of your employees is or, or team members rather is through the way that you communicate and lay out those expectations and then you know hold them accountable and hold yourself accountable you know for the things that they expect of you and I think that 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 is very important because it builds a lot of the trust or trust characteristics yeah you in bet. The team. yeah I mean um Bringing new people on board um, is extremely expensive. Um, we're a very process workflow oriented company just because that's something that I really believe in and I love messing around in Microsoft Visio. Um, but um, onboarding is extremely expensive and being able to keep team members um, for years is not, I mean, not only valued from the perspective of bringing new team members on board, but they develop relationships with your customers and um there's you know some guys that have been with us <coughs> excuse me for five plus years out of being in business for 10 years um 
and we're at the point of, you know, having 15 people now and, you know, having multiple people that are, have been there for five plus years, they know, they know most of the customers' names. They know a lot of the customers' wives and husbands and kids' names and, you know, all it's, it, it is a big family. And, um, there's a lot of responsibility, obviously, that comes with making sure that they can still go home with their wages and that you're providing an environment to where they can take home more on a regular basis. Um, when they see the economy doing well, they want to do well. Um, and sometimes that means that in order to give them what they want um, and what they deserve, um, unfortunately, I'm the type of person that is is much too willing to forego it for myself and make sure that they get it. And from a long-term strategic perspective, that's not always healthy either. You know, it's really, really tough to try to find a balance. Um, what I think the most important thing to do is to find someone that you also have a deep amount of trust in and an understanding of who is strong in those areas that you can bring into the business some way, somehow to, uh, to make sure that those checks and balances are there. You really have to self-assess. I mean, just as much as there is 90 day and 12 um, month plans for every team member and that we go through 90 day reviews, we do that same thing with management all the way up to me. Um, I get reviewed by three different people every 90 days. So that, that self-assessment um, is always something that needs to happen no matter at what level you're at, you know. Yeah, it's something we talked about in one of the earlier podcasts uh, on Forever Unbreakable was the need for self-assessment and like how often one should do it. And should it be, you know, somebody else assessing you? Should you be the one assessing yourself? And I think both are very critical in human development and making an individual just a better person because it's not always, and, I, and I'm sure your um, uh, self-development, you know, if it's a worksheet or whatever, I'm sure it hits on more than just what you've done for the business, but also, you know, the personality <clears throat> that you have as an individual, like, are you aggressive by nature or are you, you know, more of a passive person? And like, how can you begin to change those things to make yourself a better individual in general? Because then you'll be better you know, in every, every aspect of your life and you'll live a healthier and happier life. I, I honestly believe. So I think that's super important, uh, key to success anywhere and everywhere is this, this self-development. I would, I would guess that that's done a lot for the business and the growth in the business. Yeah. But it's also, it's also something that costs the business a lot of money, you know, yeah, in I'm order sure to manage that for, you know, as an example, if if my service manager and one of my best techs is inside of a is inside of a meeting, that's costing the organization a lot of money. Yeah. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, it, it's not always about money, but the way that my team members, the majority of them, feel incentivized by what they bring to the table every day is by giving them something monetarily back. They want they want the money. You know, there's, there is most definitely others that want the PTO or others that want the benefits. And I mean, it's pretty stereotypical, right? You know, the, um, the guy that is, is newly married and has a wife and is, um, you know, having a couple kids and so forth, that that's going to mean something to him. Um, the, 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 there's some of those things are going to mean more be more important to him um the a young guy coming scr straight out of school and he's hungry to just work all the hours he cares and... about one thing he <laughs> wants that he wants the money i think warren yeah, buffett exactly. warren buffett said it best i'm pretty sure it was warren buffett who said like they were asking him in an interview when will you you know what is enough money in and, and his answer was more like there is no such thing as ever making enough money and i think that's just how we are as a society. And and that is like everybody wants more, more, more. And, you know, I and I think it's not a bad thing. I think it, you know, drives competition. It makes us, you know, move forward as a as a country and as a world faster. Um, and in a lot of ways, I think I think that it's good. You know, you can look at a guy like Elon Musk. And he's got more money than you could ever shake a stick at, but he wants, you know, more space travel and more, you know, 
um, technology creation and things like that. And I, so I think wanting more is a good thing, but I think that, you know, so like you said, from a business standpoint, it's tough when as a business in order to, for the business to grow and you to be able to reward, you know, your employees financially, the business needs to make more money in the profit column in the profit column to be able to do that. And so if you're not doing that, you can't do that. And if you're putting these guys in meetings for an hour and a half to do a, a self-assessment review, then you lose out on an hour and a half worth of revenue for the company, you know, so you're losing in, you're losing their pay from the company and they're not making any revenue at that time. Oh yeah. So it's a very bad financial decision, but would you say that the overall development from it increases revenue long term? Oh, it, it, um, it, I think yes, it does, but it's, there are so many different things that it touches on. Not only the fact that they feel that they have a platform to be able to say how they feel about their team members, the business as a whole. We always say that that is, that is the time to where you are expected to ask something of us and we may ask something in return. It, it should always be a, a, a give and take type of relationship. It should never be just one person giving and another person taking, so to speak. Um, but where it provides more value is not only in making sure that that they have a roadmap and that they have something to look forward to into the future, but it's that platform of, again, setting expectations and communicating with each other um, and showing them that the business really does care about them and their business desires whatever that might mean in terms of personal desires and how we can accommodate, you know, those things mutually, so to speak. Um, I had shared a quote with you before, um, and I, I forget who it is. I, I should really probably polish up whatever this is, but it's um, <laughs> where you um, train them to the point to where they could leave and go anywhere, but um, take care of them to where they will never want to leave you. And I, I think that is just so true. I enjoy the heck out of the people that I work with. And I mean, they're, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade them for anything. They're, they're just, they're a heck of a lot of fun to work with. You spend so much time with these people on a regular basis. Dude, like, wouldn't, 40 why wouldn't, hours a week minimum. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, minimum. And I know yeah. that you work late all the time. You guys yeah. work tons of weekend hours. Like mm -hmm. I see it all the time. Cause you'll, you know, I'll text you to go do something and be like, I'm, buried in a project right now and I need to get this done for this client or you know we've been out to a nice dinner and you've you've had to you know take a call with a client to make sure that you know they're being taken care of because some service that you offer them is currently potentially having an issue and you need to get a tech on it or you need to be the tech and I think that that you know the way that you care for your employees and the way that you care for your customers I think has everything to do with why your business is now you know successful and, and able to you know compensate your employees and, and take care of them and things like that I think has a lot to do with you know the way that you develop your employees and how you take care of them and, and the customers so that they don't want to leave you well luckily um uh, I don't have to like answer support calls anymore and stuff, which is super, super nice because <laughs> man, some of these guys get really beat up, um, just because of the number of accounts that we manage now. I mean, hundreds of servers, um, it's, you know, many, many, many organizations. Um, there's, there's thousands of things that can go wrong that can alert us. Um, but Every once in a while, I actually was at a meeting today with a customer where the customer had said, yeah, it was one o'clock in the morning on Easter and I had an issue and who shows up? Jeremiah shows up and, and he's who answered the phone and blah, blah, blah. And it was because my service manager, he was, he was like, you know, it always seems like on the holidays, I, I end up getting to be the one that's on call. So I think it was last Easter or the Easter before I was like, I'm going to take Easter weekend this weekend, you know? And I just sometimes I think as a leader, and it reminds me of that show, um, like Undercover Boss or whatever it yeah. is, you know, being able to put yourself in those situations to where you can dive into the trenches with your teammates really not only helps build that trust with them, um, it helps them understand that you're just as human as they are. Um, and it also, I think one of the most important reasons why I want to do it is 
I want to do it is quality control. I, I want to I want to check to make sure that when I get that phone call and I create that ticket and I go to log into whatever device it might be, I want to see that username and password there. I want to make sure that that password is, you know, as many characters long as it can be and that it's randomly generated. Um, there, there's all of there's all of these things that it allows me to see and make sure that we're doing things the Innova way to holding up the highest of expectations for ourselves as a brand. You know, that's something that that's really important to us and that we that we also talk about on a regular basis is the fact that we don't want our customers to rely on Bill or George or Jim, so to speak. We want them to rely on the brand because if we don't do that, then we're not providing value to the organization that we've decided to spend half of our life in. Yeah. Um, Cause this, it's really a career organization. We, we sell consultants. It's not like we're a company just pumping out widgets and what we sell are, you know, a hundred thousand wid- widgets a day. So, um, <laughs> the, the human capital side of what we do is just so vital and making sure that you've got good team members that you trust um, to be able to get things done around you at the level that you yourself do your work is just so vital to the brand. It, yeah. It's absolutely vital. I've, uh, and that's one of the things I tell my soldiers all the time is like, I will never ask you to do something that I'm not willing to do myself. And I think that as a leader, you know, as one of the leadership characteristics that I, that I look at in my good squad leaders, my good team leaders and the soldiers that are, are about to become or put in leadership roles is do they do the hard, not easy, you know, the, the hard work and the work that they're asking their soldiers to do. You know, it's not that they've done it once when they were a soldier because I was a private and did it once as a private because my NCO told me I had to, but now as a leader, like I'll grab a garbage bag out of the garbage can and take it outside or, you know, things like that, that, you know, they know that I'm willing to do the same exact thing and that I'm not putting myself in a position of betterment above them, even though I am above them. Doesn't it piss you off that there's people though, that, that like, that refuse to, to be human like everyone else? Uh, You know what I'm saying? It drives me nuts when somebody thinks that because they've accomplished something or made it to a point in their life that they no longer are on the same level as everybody else. They are now a step above which is not at all um, and not at all a case like we are both human beings and regardless of where we are in the social totem pole like we're still human beings yeah but that but that is you being self-aware and being an egotistical something is you being a human being right yeah. because that's just that's i think that's just naturally how that kind of goes but um, those, and therefore I see them as being weak people, you know, that, yeah, no, I fully agree. That's definitely not being strong minded. Not at all. Means. Not at all. I like that. I'm glad that that came up. That's a, that's a nice piece. I like, uh, so now as we talk about, um, so there was really two things there too, but the one that I want to talk the most about is you talk about being a career company you know, where people come and, and that's their career, where they're going to stay until the day that they retire. And so the one, like, I see this with you all the time, and it wasn't until I wanted to bring you onto the podcast that I started to look at it as I started to formulate things that I wanted to talk to Jeremiah about. And that was how you are able to look at things and goals that are so far away that they, to me, seem impossible. Right. When I look at like the things that you've done and the goals that you set and how far away they are, they come off as almost impossible. And yet you achieve them or or you're well on your way to achieving them. And so for those of you that don't know Jeremiah, Jeremiah is a huge plant collection um, of bonsai trees and, and stuff like that that he's spent years growing in these bonsai trees. I mean, we were talking about it again the other night because they're, they're so fascinating to me. But you go into a growing a bonsai tree, knowing that this is a 15 or 30 or 45 year long project that you're going to undertake. Like it's, you need to pay attention to it and do, you know, water it and provide it the right amount of light and the right, you know, pH balance of the water and P 
pin it and get it to grow in a certain pattern and, and do things. Well, you do the same thing with, with business. Like you see, when you started Innova, you saw it as a, as a career company and you're putting employees on this career path. So every employee that comes in the door, you're seeing, you know, 15 years, 20, 25, 30 years down the road for them, you know, and a lot of people struggle to see past tomorrow. Yeah. And we definitely don't focus, you know, that's one, I never really looked at my hobby of growing plants as something relational to the business until you and I had talked about it before. Um, but it's funny because it's not a very good way to apply that in it in business. And it helps me understand kind of why I am who I am. So I, I absolutely understand, you know, day one checks in hand business starts. I know that someday I want to, I want to build this thing to be $10 million or more. And as soon as I get to that point, I know that I'm, I'm exit strategy ready. Um, and that is, that could be, you know, at that time that could have been 10 years or 40 years. I, who knew, you know, yeah. the terrible thing about, about looking at it that way, like I do my plants is that similar to my plants, you know, you don't expect mother nature to come in and blow a 50 pound tree over and break off a branch that you've been working on for 12 years. <laughs> um, and you, you have that same type of stuff that happens in business, but, um, ultimately from a business perspective, it was to understand that I really had to understand short-term wins. Um, and establishing more short-term goals because I'm willing to I'm willing to do whatever I need to do to to see my long-term goals out. But my other team members aren't, and that's not necessarily bad or wrong of them. It's just that I've chosen to be the leader. They didn't. They chose they chose for me to lead them, so to speak. Absolutely. Um, or and and for some of them to lead with them. And it's just so, so, you know, back to the relationship between the hobbies, um, there, there are some things that are drastically different. And I will say that from the perspective of being able to find those small wins and, um, and to do those things, my service manager is a great complement to where I am weak from that perspective. Um, and something else that we've also talked about is, from that self-awareness side, understand where understanding where your weaknesses are and surrounding yourself with people that can complement your weaknesses so that together is one you're you're very strong. You know, and I and I'm sure that is nothing new of a principle anywhere. Um, but just, you know, basic, you know, why doesn't that make sense? Yeah, yeah, no, and it's in and it's important. And I think and that's why I wanted to bring it up because like your well, you have these long-term goals and that's, you know, what I see is like something that is extremely remarkable and very few people can see that far down the road and continue with absolute focus towards that goal, right? Towards the goal of making a, creating a company where you can get to a point where you can look at an exit strategy and, you know, creating plants that take shape the way that you want them to take shape and to get to all these points in your life is is because you set a goal that's so far out and you stay focused on the goal and don't let things affect you and now that you've you know learned through your experiences in business to appreciate the small goals you know you're able to provide the smaller goals to your to your team members but still keeping those small goals you know within so much left or right of this focus towards the long-term goal. Yeah. And I think that that is, you know, again, a lot to do with, with success for anybody who's trying to become an entrepreneur or in any leadership role is knowing the long-term goal as a leader. I think it's super important to have the long-term goal and then be able to, you know, set small goals and rewards for those small goals, whether they just be a pat on the back and a compliment or or whatever they might oh, be. Oh man, please and thank you, you go know? such a far way with communicating yeah. and setting expectations. It's unbelievable. I never realized that until I started working with an organization where there are not please and thank yous. And man, 
if you want to see it takes the, the wind out of your sail dude the black and white difference between walking through my office doors and someone else's um in in our office doors i i really should say um but um uh i was gonna say something in relation to the plants and the, and the business. <laughs> <laughs> i think my brain's just like give me another margarita <laughs> So we've had a margarita so far, and it's uh, it's all Jeremiah's had though. This is my second one, um, but it's been this has been awesome. Like, this is the stuff that I wanted to hit on. That I think like all too often on on this podcast platform, it's talked about physical achievement goals, um, you know, or somebody's health struggle or or weight loss or you know, a lot of other things. And I think that business has a tremendous amount of struggle. And there's so much that can be, that can be taught to us. You know, entrepreneurs are often, you know, seen as some of the world's best leaders. And I, and I look at them as, as some of the world's best leaders, I think oftentimes go into entrepreneurship because they know that their leadership capabilities have the ability to generate profit and they do it through, through leadership. One of the guys that, you know, I know that we've both used as a, as a mentor is Jocko Willink and his business is founded on leadership and that's all he teaches is how to become a better leader. That dude is an animal. And it is just, it's remarkable what you can learn from, from great leaders. And I've learned a tremendous amount from you, you know, over the last few years that we've been hanging out on how to, you know, things that you do in your business, I take back to my job in the military and, and I apply them immediately. And vice I'm like, versa. This is great. And vice versa. Yeah. You know, there's one, one thing that I, one thing that I, you know, first really learned a couple of years ago was how important developing SOPs are. Like I, I, I'm, you know, that's one thing that I wish that I, I wish that I would have acquired knowledge of some way, somehow without having to do it was to like go work in some very rigid corporate environment to where it was process and policy, everything and SOP, yeah. this and that. Um, but because I didn't come from any of that, it's taken me a long time to realize that those are very important and vital business tools. Um, just as much as, um, it took me way too long to understand what a P and L balance sheet and all of those types of financial statements were. If you're a business owner and you don't know what those things are, and you're not keeping a very close eye on those things then you are just cheating yourself unfortunately and it and it took and it took the it took me taking on the responsibility of writing the ship of the business to to be forced to learn that stuff and thank god it happened at that time otherwise we wouldn't be where we are today as a as an organization um but man what a painful lesson um, yeah. So yeah, if you can, some of the painful lessons are the most well learned though, because you'll you never, you'll never forget it. You got that right, and you pound it into everybody's head because, you know, some of the things that you told me as I as I began the the journey of the podcast was those exact things like make sure that you have a plan with policies, and and things to move forward if you ever grow this into something bigger that you have it and you're ready to go. Set Cause, expectations because it's so Just important. Set them today makes it a lot easier. So the last two things, but you that... got to make sure you stay the fuck out of your way too. Though. You know, like you can definitely get in your own way, and you just have to stay out of your way sometimes. That's where, you know, that's why sometimes, yes, yeah, self evaluation is important. But if you're going to do it for, you know, every other hour during the day, every day, well, no, that's just not going to work for you. So, yes. You definitely have to get in your head, but sometimes you also have to get the heck out of your way. So yeah, and just get way. and get results. Yeah. Sometimes it's very results based, and and you have to do whatever it takes to get those results. Sometimes yeah. you know. And so the last two things I want to talk to you about are the famous two things from Forever Unbreakable, and I think we're definitely going to have you back on here again because I think there's a lot of important business things that that we need to talk about. And the next time we do it, I think we'll get uh, somebody like Jason and do. You know, uh, how does he do things in business versus how do you do things in business and get some some cool conversation going? Because I've I've been fortunate enough to hear it on the back patio 
Um, and I think it would be, you know, super beneficial because I've taken so much from those conversations. Yeah. Well, I mean, if that's going to be the case, we should probably start it off like the back patio usually does with like margaritas or shots of tequila. Absolutely. Right, yeah. Fair enough. Then we'll be, we'll be telling all sorts of stories on here. <laughs> yeah. Um, but so the next thing I want to talk to you about is, is unbreakable. Like what is unbreakable to you, especially in the, in the business world where you've almost had to close the doors, you know, and tell everybody that, hey, business is, business is done. Sorry, I can't employ you anymore and I can't take care of, of you guys because i got to go yeah. do my own thing. I think um, I, I define being unbreakable as essentially taking on the responsibility of being the leader for my team and making sure that, that if I promise them something that I'm going to actually follow through on that. And if, um, yeah, I mean, and that, that can, that can go a long way and that can be subjective, but there's, they're, they're depending on me. You know, they have, they have, many of them have nicer houses than I do. And I, and I'm (laughs) totally cool with that, you know, and, and that's because they've decided to take a path in life, um, that is comfortable for them. And I'm taking a path in life that's comfortable for me. I would like to actually, you know, be a little bit more risky in business, but I also have a team that helps me make my decisions. I don't make them all by myself. And, you know, my wife being one of them, Chelsea being one of them, she helps make those decisions too. And to compliment me being very risky and risk, um, you know, and, and wanting to take those risks, she, she is not a risky type. She's not a risk person. taker at exactly. all. <laughs> so, so there's that compliment, you know, that balance, so to speak. So, so again, the, the unbreakable part is really just, again, um, being there, no matter if it means that I need to be a shoulder to cry on, um, that I need to, that if I can, you know, had had the example where we had a team member who had a, a very tragic thing happen with one of their parents. How much time do you need to be away from work? Um, I don't care. Is it days, weeks, months? How many is it? Just do whatever you need to do. Yeah, it's that being, foundation. Being able to be a leader for your team is um, in f- what I do in my life. That that's that's how. Um, if if I can be everything I want to be in that, which. You know, I think guys like you and I always fail to achieve the things that we want to be of ourselves. But um, the more I can be that, the more I'm unbreakable. And I think I think that's the perfect definition, especially with this episode of, you know, being more about leadership in that <clears throat> you're constantly like you just said, you know, if we fail to achieve what we want to achieve in the aspect of leadership and that is that just constant pursuit of wanting to be a better leader and knowing that there is always room to improve on your leadership skills. Absolutely. And I, I think that was, that was a, it couldn't have been said any better. Absolutely. So the last thing I want to ask is what's next for Jeremiah? What do you, oh, you know, man. what's next either business, what's next with the business, what's next with you in life? What's, you yeah. know, what's your next goal? What do you want so, next? So, um, I mean, what's next and what I want next are two different things, but um, (laughs) what's next is more growth of the business, um, surrounding myself with other um, entrepreneurs that are just like me, that are like-minded, that want all of the things that I ultimately want out of being a leader in an organization. Um, So um, going down those paths and exploring those opportunities... um, and that's coming up in the near future. Um, what what I personally want, you know, this, I mean, you've probably heard it from me before. Dude, there's there's just one thing that I want out of my personal life so bad. I just want a greenhouse. I know you do. <laughs> just a I huge just greenhouse. A greenhouse. <laughs> just, just, it's so much easier to take care of my plants when they're in a greenhouse instead of hauling them up and down the steps in the winter and in the, in the spring and... Oh, it'd be so nice to just have a greenhouse, but yeah, someday I'll get there. There you will. And then that's what I love is like, you know, and that's why I wanted to bring the plants into it because I know how important they are to you. Yeah. And I see it much like how you've grown the businesses. You have the small goals in your plants of getting it to do this over the next six months and to shape, you know, and curve this way and that way. And you know what? 
If you do I the come same thing on again, I could bring one of my really small you should have trees brought one. as a as a special guest. You should have brought <laughs> one. <laughs> it's probably got a remarkable story of all of the time uh, because I've had to when you guys have been on vacation, I've had to go over and water and talk about one of the most anxiety filled, stressful things. Yeah, yeah, right. Is watering your plants that are 15 plus years old and knowing oh, well, that like some of them are over 50 years old. Yeah, and knowing that I could mess this up. Like Jeremiah's got his entire life Dude, it's, tied into this plant, and I could be the guy everyone who messes up his plant. <laughs> I, it, it blows my mind that people struggle to keep plants alive Dude, because oh, I'm they're the so worst. resilient. I'm the worst. <laughs> oh man, it's like what drywall is to contractors. Man, there's so much give and take, but people still they still manage to mess it all up. It's just Dude, the way it is. Exactly. It's part know. of being human. It's it part is. Of being human. It is. I love it. Well, that's all I got. Do you got anything you want to, any last words you want to say? No, that's it, man. That's yeah. it. Appreciate you This is a good me time. I love this stuff. I'll be back anytime you want. Perfect. We're going to definitely do it again. So thanks everybody for tuning in. Remember to stay unbreakable out there and continue to work on your leadership skills. They can always get better. Thanks everybody. See ya. We're out.